What's up out there, you guys? Marty Schwartz here with uh, Marty Music. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee right now, and we're actually about to meet one of the most legendary guitar techs of all time, last 35 years. His name is Maple Byrne, and apparently, he has the most amazing guitar collection, almost guitar museum, in his house right here. You guys are gonna watch me meet him for the first time, and we are going to see the glory of his amazing collection. So, shall we do it? Let's go. Hey, you're Maple. I am. How do you, Marty? Hey, Pleasure really. Pleasure to meet you. Really nice to meet you. So, okay, this is amazing. Guitar lovers always <laughs> welcome here. This is your house. This is my house. <laughs> All right. You work with Emmy Lou Harris? I do. But you've you've been in, in the game here for for quite a while. Yeah, well, I've been with Emmy for 35 years. Oh wow. So uh, you like uh, guitars? I do like guitars, <laughs> and they like me. <laughs> I, I don't blame them. If I was a guitar here, I would like you too. How many do you do you have? I only have one of anything. Okay. I'm I'm not into duplication. Everything should have its own little voice and niche. Come on down. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I didn't. I didn't know there was a downstairs. Oh yes. I spent the den. Wow. The octave guitar. Oh yeah. As yeah, in yeah. the octave neck of the Mose Wright Joe Mafus, the uh, Mando guitar, which okay. is sort of an octave twelve string, I guess you'd say. The Omnichord. I remember these. The Omnichord. <laughs> At least that's one I don't have to tune. <laughs> yeah. Check out. Oh yeah, the Vegematic buttons are fantastic. Vegematic? <laughs> yeah, they really are. It's like a blender. What did these things do? Is it had to do with Well, the... one does all the pickups, and of course, one does none of the pickups. Brilliant. <laughs> and then the combinations are in presets. Wow. And that is the very beginning of the Dan Electros. Oh, wow. Acoustic guitar with no <laughs> sound hole. I can't resist oh, being, a, being a... Double neck. I mean... You don't have to play guitar to look cool with this thing. Is that what you call it, a guitar organ? That's what they called it. The guitar organ people sued them, I think. Magnetones of Los Angeles. That would be your basic working man's Tysco. They sold them through uh, Kmart, I believe. Well, Maple, thank you so much for showing me uh, the guitars. I think we've only cracked the surface, but it would be a blast if we could maybe go up and fire some up. Let's play them. All right, let's do That's it. That's what they're for. <laughs> I like you, I like you. <laughs> so the first guitar we've got here from your massive collection, tell me what this is. That is a uh, National Glenwood 99, which is a Rezo glass, or plastic as we call it. But Rezo glass sounds so much cooler. <laughs> uh, known as a map-shaped guitar, kind of resembles, here's Maine, here's Florida. <laughs> And I assume it was made in America. Made in uh, America around 1959. Yeah, and this also kind of reminds me of something like some of these garage rockers are now getting into. Absolutely. Which is pretty cool to think that this is like an old vintage it's guitar. It's great that those guitars came back out into favor. Yeah. You know? Is there anything you can say about these sounding different because of the Rezo glass? Well, they originally they're wood and they do sound completely different. Yeah. It's more of a hollow sound because it is more hollow. The, the other ones are plank of wood and it's a much thicker sound. And I think of that raunchy garage You should give them sound. a little bit of the early piezo so, in the bridge. It's a lucite bridge foot with a very pickup cool. in it. <laughs> I don't think they were going for an acoustic sound, but it's a sound. The regular sound of the magnetic pickups is... Valco and it Chicago. What year is this guitar from? Probably a 59. Because I gotta say, it's got that 50s hot rod dynamic, like the aesthetic of like a 50s Chevy, 57 very, Chevy. Very, very carish. Right, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, that is cool. Yeah. Also, I, is this but, plastic too? Or yeah, reso glass? That's plastic. 
with cool out. design. Because this is Lucite, so this is probably something similar. Right. And then we that was all very modern material at the time, brand new out state of DuPont. Of the art. Yeah. State of the art. And they did use car, all these guitars use car paint, car colors. All the Fender custom colors are Duco. Okay. DuPont colors. Did they call cars surf green and fiesta red and all those, that? Those are actually car okay. colors. Okay. I'm, I'm learning. Yeah. Some of you are learning. Some of you know, some of you don't. And then, so we've got one pickup per switch here? Yeah, that's not the most versatile wiring harness ever, sure. but... Uh, but it looks It nice. does a job, yeah. And then, why three, why six knobs? Three volumes and three tones. Okay. So you, you could probably, uh, although Jack White would have some kind of crazy fuzz... Yeah, you could it. probably rewire it to get combinations, but it's, it's yeah. not designed to do that. And, and then... Is this like a rubber now? Yeah, it's a rubber bumper. This is actually, <laughs> this actually gives a little bit. It is rubber, yeah. Wow. So it's made in two halves and put together with sort of a ceiling grommet there. Are these kind of hard to find or? The higher end ones are. There's, there's a few around them. There's different periods of them, the wooden ones. Yeah. At some point they slightly change the shape of the map. And uh, I'm sure some people. Oh, like when Puerto, we got Puerto Rico is. Yeah, I think originally they didn't have this. Cut out. Alaska. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Cool. And then uh, I actually really dig the the wear on the back there. And what, what creates and the, the Gumby headstock. The Gumby headstock. Oh, yes. That's a good way to describe it for sure. Um, and then what happens with, why, how does this get aged and weathered like that? It used to be the, the white color, I, I assume, right? I imagine it yellowed from sunlight. Yeah. That's generally the, and sometimes in the case, the flocking of the case reacts with some of the chemicals in the plastics. Mm -hmm. It's very true of old celluloid pick guards. Uh, you can go in some cases and it's just, there's no lining to the case left in the shape of the pick guard because there's gas. Oh. And, and a lot of them have to be replaced. This is a little bit later era, so it might be safer. Well, this is a sweet one, man. It's a I, solid guitar and heavy. It's really cool. It's so cool looking. And uh, yeah, I really dig it. I really dig the style of it. All right, so we've got another amazing guitar from your awesome collection, Gibson ES-335. Can That's you tell correct. me a little bit uh, about it and how you got it? Uh, it's a thin line uh, blonde dot neck, 1959. I had a hard time getting that one, actually. <laughs> now, did you get this from Norman's Rare Guitars? I got guitars? that from Norm, yes. Yeah, it's very cool. So a third party and... Uh, there was an earthquake involved where it was paid for and locked up for a long time and I didn't <laughs> see it, so. But it was worth, it was worth the wait. Um, so were you like looking for a 335 in particular? Or? Yeah, I was definitely looking for a blonde 335 dot neck and dot marker, I guess is the proper term. And, okay. and I had one that wasn't quite it and uh, I realized how good they could be, and so I figured I'm gonna have to step up. So I'm gonna have one around the house. Yeah, so 59. What second was the year. Second year yeah. of the 335s? Correct. And it's uh, got a different toned, colored. Got a mahogany neck mahogany on a maple neck. body. Very sweet. That's um, a blues machine. <laughs> yeah, I know, I was, I was gonna hit some, in some notes there. You go. Known for their sustain because it has a solid center. Surprisingly versatile, though. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, because you see guys play jazz. Absolutely. Heavy rock. Yeah. You got the blues. You got yeah. the classic rock. Is there any uh, other unique stories about this guitar, or anything else you know about it? It's been used on a few recordings in town. It's it's a prime example, and certain songs just call for that kind do of guitar, you, and it's you, not something you see every day. So you let, I mean... I have let people use it, You yes. let people use it, yeah. people use it. Well, and, and uh, something I've known from hanging out with you here today is that uh, you're very much of that school that these are oh, tools need, to be played. They need to be played. They need to be played. Yeah, they so. need to be tuned, they need to be played. Yeah, it's they need kinda, to be restrung every once in a while, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I... A lot of work. Going through your house, it looks like you can spend a lot of time doing that. Well, it does keep you busy. Yeah, well, that's good. No, I appreciate it. Everybody usually is a two pickup guy, or like uh, sort of that Stratish. 
We'll call it out of phase, it's not real. Or these are so different. Very stable. The aluminum makes them very stable. So tell me what uh, guitar this is. What is this? Uh, that is a Italian guitar by a maker named Vandre Pioli, who has come into uh, prominence now as an artist as well as a guitar maker. Um, and that particular one is an import uh, by an accordion dealer in Chicago. Thus, what you call the accordion buttons? That has buttons. accordion buttons, <laughs> has an aluminum neck way ahead of its time. Uh, and Three. Pick Three ups. pickups is kind of unusual in these. Do you call these humbuckers or? They are single coil pickups. Single coil pickups. They're large, but they're single coil. And they're uh, amazing, wonderful Italian pickups. Uh, this model is popularized by Buddy Miller, who's okay. played, played them for many years and uh, put them on the map. And would you hear some spaghetti Western music with this guitar? You would hear some Italian spaghetti Western. It's definitely on some of those soundtracks. Yeah, yeah. That is so cool. And just this company, this is very conventional for uh, Vandre. Uh, most of his guitars look like Salvador Dali had a hand in the uh, <laughs> layout of them. And then them. we've got this red sparkle. Red sparkle. Is that what we... It's actually a wooden guitar of plywood, hollow, and with a very resinous paint, which includes the... Uh, Sparkle. Okay, it feels really hollow. It's very hollow. Yeah, and when you play it, it's got that. Yeah. And the hollow bar and the hollow neck are a, a very important part of the sound on those. And then something you it's were quite unique. Something you were pointing out, we can't really see from this angle, is that the strings are actually looping through these little metal triangles under here. Yeah, they're so can like, cantilevered and suspended, which we have no explanation for whatsoever. <laughs> It's very hard to string when you got a broken string, I'll tell you. Yeah, I bet. Through. And then it does have this really cool white on red look to it. So it's definitely artistic. Uh, the guy is considered a fine artist in, right. in Europe, and his, his guitars are considered sculpture. So I say this is a great guitar, and it's the plainest one in the line that I have. And uh, simplicity sometimes has its advantages. How'd you get this one? Well, Buddy had played them for years, and he basically said, well, you'll never find one of these. <laughs> and uh, that was the first of 10. And I, I have to say I'm partially responsible for driving up the market as <laughs> I well, got through some of the stranger models. Well, when people watch the video, you may have just done it again. Well, that's, that's the way it goes. <laughs> it, this one's yours. So. I'm not ashamed. <laughs> yeah. And this, this whole little... Thing here. Yeah, it's sort of an ashtray, we yeah, call it. Yeah, you know? that's what it reminds me of. Well, it was an accordion importer, so I yeah. think he had something to do with that. And there's a lot of unexplainable things about this line of guitars. But, you know, it was bought to be a wall hanger and happened to be plugged in, and they find out that they're fantastic instruments. They're a bit fragile. Yeah. But uh, other than that, they're just astounding instruments. And it, you can also see the that it's yeah, they, they, like reverse arch it's, top? It's, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a curved, concave curve that goes under because of the metal bar that runs through it. Oh, I see. Wow, funky. Yeah, the guy was a genius. Yeah. There's no question about it. And he, he definitely followed his own drummer. He, wow. Many of these features have not been adopted by other makers. Wow, so cool. <laughs> Tone. You don't need an amp. <laughs> so you need the Miazzi. Miazzi. Miazzi, another Italian. Wow, che bella! <laughs> Sorry, my Italian's it's a little got rusty. Got a speaker on the back too. So we've Battery got battery-powered germanium transistors. What? What more could you need? So that's off. Yeah. 
transistor radio. Yeah, amps are overrated. Check that out. Play it on the beach. Hair on my arms stand. Yeah. So, what year is this thing from? I suspect it's a mid '60s okay. instrument. Who would who would use these in the '60s? Boy, you got me there. <laughs> wow, I got you on one, huh? Yeah, I I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it actually has a connection with the uh, Vondre guitars. The uh, creator of the Vondre guitars did the electronic parts of it for a partner of his, and uh, not something you see every day. No, How, where'd you get this thing from? I came from Italy. We actually kind of sight unseen made a deal for a couple of pieces, um, and uh, then you got to find out what kind of batteries need to go into it, which they just discontinued evidently. But I'm sure there's some way to. Yeah, you get them from Europe. Okay. Oh, so it's just some funky European battery? Yeah, actually the batteries they use for lighting somewhat. It's a 4.5 volt, looks like a lantern battery with two clips. Wow. But Duracell stopped making them, so I just bought some from Las Vegas and they're in, in Italian. How would you get some feedback? You just... Uh, hit a sustain up the neck. I'll play a note. There you go. I'm telling you, you could go along, you could spend a lot of money on amps trying to get that sound. <laughs> yeah, it's true, actually. This is super cool. And there are some guitars that have an amp under the strings. Okay. Which really just endless feedback loop. So what was the first guitar you ever got? Well, I bought a Gibson uh, LG2 out on, t on payments at Jenkins Music in Kansas City when I was 16, I guess. Then, you know, then we had, you know, protest music came in and... I made quite a name for myself in high school as a protest singer, <laughs> being you know, somewhat of a pinko and didn't go over real big, but you know, was inspired by all those yeah. players and still am. You know, How'd mean, you learn your first like chord or melody? Someone show you or did you get a book or a teacher? Well, on the banjo, there's the Pete Seeger book. So I knew that you could find stuff, chord books, and he tells about different styles. And in those days, what we used to do was get the songbooks mm -hmm. that goes with the record. And of course, most of those were in the right key, mm -hmm. unlike, you know, nowadays it's all in horn keys. But most of them was very simple stuff, a few chords, but you could actually play along with the record. Mm -hmm. And you would have the book in front of you if you got confused. You might have to transpose because, you know, people used capos and stuff even back then. Right. You know. And about that time, I heard a couple people who could really play. And they weren't like world famous, but you know, somebody would come into our little coffee house and these guys could play. Right. And I went, oh, <laughs> I'll never do that. I don't care if, you know, how old I ever got, I could never do that. So it led me to more to the appreciation side of it. All my guitar collections based on probably what I think I heard somebody play. Right, right. What's on some record. It's all really comes out of that. Yeah, and you get a sense memory from... Yeah. This is your favorite acoustic that you have. Well, there's no question that this instrument sounds better than anything else in this house. I mean, there's <laughs> just, you can't argue with that. 1939. 1939. D28, herringbone. Martin D28. 1939. 1939. That's just amazing. Some what? people think they're booming. <laughs> I think it sounds like a nine foot grand piano myself. Right, right. It actually is quite versatile. Wow. It'll do just about anything a guitar should. Do 
you know anything about the hands it passed through before you had it? Um, I got it from the late Stan Jay, who was a mandolin brother. Okay. The mandolin brothers, and it was his personal one that he put away. And I had bought one, my first uh, Dreadnought, my first Martin, I guess. Um, and it was not great. Uh-huh. And he advertised this guitar as sounding like Clarence White, Tony Rice's guitar. And I said, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> and in those days, you pretty much had to buy stuff sight unseen because you couldn't get around that easily. But it was probably twice as much as I'd paid for the refinished one that I had. And it did sound like Tony Rice's guitar. It sounds like itself, but it sounds as good as a guitar can sound. And I went, oh, you pay twice as much. This is what you get. And I've been chasing that ever since and never happened again. How, how long have you had this one? I've had this one for about uh, 40 years. Wow. Prize possession. Well, it would be the last one to leave. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's never been any trouble. Um, you know, certain things come and go and they act up. And yeah. I string it pretty heavy and it's always just held up well. And then what, to, uh, tell me about the wood. It's a Brazilian rosewood guitar with spruce, Adirondack spruce top, as they all were back then. Um, I, I tend to have a lot of maple and rosewood guitars as opposed to mahogany. And then the wood itself, uh, I, I, you'll be able to correct me, but isn't the wood itself even older than when they In made the cases, guitar? In many cases, yes. In many, many cases, cases, it could be a few hundred cases, years old. In many cases, they take it out of an old floorboard or something like that. Probably in the 30s, they were probably getting, they were probably cutting down the trees and making the wood. I don't, I don't know the complete story on that, but I suspect they were getting fresh wood in right. those days. It just had time to age. Wow. That's pretty cool. It's pretty extraordinary. Yeah. It, it's in pretty amazing condition for the how old it is. It's, yeah, it's decent. It's, it's all original. And, uh, you know, a little honest wear is a good thing because if a guitar is completely unplayed, there may be a reason. Right. But in the long run, whether there's a reason or not, it's not as broken in right. as something that's been played. It can, you can go too far. Right. And we were talking earlier about some guitars that I've been enjoying lately have been completely restored. But the main thing is, does the instrument speak to you? Don't let anybody tell you what, sh <laughs> what you should be playing. Right, right. You know? A lot of people like the feel of a smaller guitar, a lighter guitar. Personally, I like the really complex sound of the harder woods, but a lot of people like to feel the mahogany vibrating against them. Yeah. It's a very popular thing, and they record very well. So you just have to, you just have to try it out and see yeah. what it speaks to you about. Gibson right there, it looks like a giant mandolin. What do we call this thing? This is a mando cello, which nice. is the low end of the mandolin orchestra. Also sounds like a delicious martini. And I'll take a watermelon mando cello, please. No unwound strings, which is a lot of weight with me. And uh, they would actually go into a town and sell them all. Mandolins, mandolas, a few guitars, and uh, mando cellos, mando bass and they would teach people to read classical music onto the fretted instruments. They would just play the cello parts. Very cool. Instrument. Much easier that you know where your notes are. And so it's tuned like a mandolin, but a octave lower, or two octave, octaves lower? Octave and a fifth lower. Oh, so. A, a mandola is a fifth below it. So you'd still. A cello and a viola and a mandolin are the same relationship. Got it. Low C. Got it, okay. And so you were talking about, uh, so classical music was something that this was used for. But and pop music. Yeah, and mandolin's obviously super, you know, a big part of bluegrass music and country music, folk music. 
et cetera. And you said that there's people using these in the studio and... Yeah, it's an interesting, it, it fills in a spot, you know, between the low end of the guitar and the bass. Yeah, do you ever loan this one out to anybody? Um, I think most people who play them have, have one. their own, yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's kind of hard to play, and so you probably have one that's set up to your standards and yeah. to your strength. And I've seen people use unusual tunings in them too. Okay. I think the actual beauty of the whole mandolin family is it's very mathematical. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's tuned straight across at the seventh fret. Right. All the way, and there's no string like on a guitar where you have to think about it. Oh, oh that it's a half step off from everything else. Right. <laughs> so you can transpose stuff very, very easily just by jumping from one string to another and it'll be a fifth above it. Or Sam Bush ever it. rock one of these? Uh, I've seen him play mandolas before. I don't know if I've actually seen him on a cello. Yeah. But, um, I imagine he'd, he'd do all right. Most likely, most likely. And what year's this thing from? I think it's around 1919 or 20. There's so much uh, craftsmanship. It's beautiful, beautiful workmanship. I mean, it's truly amazing. Do they make new one, new mandolas? I feel like they probably don't. I really don't know of anybody who's making them. There's a big bazooki craze, which is similar, which is an octave mandolin. And is bazooki which is in Greek? between. Well, originally what the Irish guys did was get the Greek bazookis, which are a bowl-backed instrument. Oh, right. Like a, little, a lot of like mandolins. A bowl, yeah. yeah. It's a bowl on the back. We call them a tater bug down okay. here. Okay, down here. And they tuned them in a droney tuning. Okay. And... Uh, so it's slightly smaller and slightly shorter scale than a, than a cello. And uh, for some reason, the octave mandolin, as we would call it, got left out of the mandolin orchestra because Gibson didn't make one and they made the rules. <laughs> right. Some other companies did make an octave mandolin. There's a stall over there on the wall. Mm. And... Uh, so there's a lot of people making instruments of that scale. Got it. This thing is dynamite. What do we got here? We got a gold top. 54 gold top. 54. 54. Yeah, well, wow. the, f the first year was not too usable and they changed to this wraparound tailpiece. And so 53? 53 has a trapeze oh, tailpiece and right. it's a little hard to get around. To, but, yeah. to drive it and these, call these P90s or? Yeah. Yeah. P90s. P90s. The earliest P90s. Nice and raunchy. A lot of people have trouble with that bridge, but I think it's, as long as you use that wound third like I always do, it's not Yeah, easy. the wound third right here. Because that's what they are made for. Yeah. Nowadays they have replacements to use for lighter strings because it just won't intonate. But Got it. And uh, Why you would use an unwound third, I have no idea. But And all the, go the old gold tops were just the cap was gold on top? So some of them are all gold. Some of them are all gold. You occasionally see one that's all gold. I don't know if they made a, a batch that was gold on the back right. or they were custom ordered. Now, when you, this, you do see them. When this was brand new, was it a shinier gold? Like, was it a more yellow gold or did it pretty much stay like this color? I think it was a deeper gold. It's probably yellowed um, with sunlight as the normal and were the was it in Kalamazoo that the that this yeah. was made in Kalamazoo? Kalamazoo yeah. yeah. Now the now Heritage Guitars has their factory there. Right. Yeah. So well, this thing is so cool. I yeah, I like the sound of the single coil pickups personally, and yeah, again saves a lot of money. Yeah. So a couple of years later, <laughs> <laughs> how would you uh, acquire this piece? Um, a a friend of mine, songwriter, um, had had it for a while, and um, I'd always liked that particular one, and I said, well, you know, if you decide you want to sell it, you know, give me the first shot at it. And uh, one day out of the blue, he came up and goes, okay, I'm ready. 
<laughs> and you kind of go, well, what am I? Oh, and no. <laughs> the same exact time, 10 minutes later, the tour manager comes up to me and goes, well, I guess you're going to do this tour because I'm not. And so it ended up being Down from the Mountain, uh, T-Bone Burnett, big production based on Oh Brother Who Art. And we did like 60 shows. So when he said... I'm ready to sell. <laughs> I wasn't ready to buy. <laughs> but I knew, you know, 10 minutes later that I would be. Yeah. By the time we got through that tour. Yeah, very cool. Whoa. So 1923 uh, F5, Gibson mandolin. It's the uh, inventor of this style is, is an interesting story because, well, for one thing, these are perfect. Yeah, the, you guys <laughs> unsurpassed. These are the holy grail instruments. I mean, there, there's a few holy grails in instruments out there. We have one right here with maple. It's an amazing but piece. But the, the gentleman, Mr. Lloyd Lore, who was at Gibson for four years in the early twenties. He decided to take the principle of violin construction and apply it to other instruments. And so he you know, cut up violins and looked at the graduation. But at that time, the F hole did not exist. These, these were the first instruments to use an F hole. All the, they were arch top guitars, but they had a round hole. Wow. And the principle of a violin is somewhat interesting that applies to these is that the F-holes actually make a separate sounding area for the higher frequency notes, which is cut off between the two F-holes, and then the lower notes vibrate completely to the edges, and it gives it a very distinctiveness separation between the different notes, particularly if you're playing any kind of a rhythm thing, which gives these their famous bluegrass chop. and. Uh, at the time, I suppose it was intended for classical music as much as anything else, since bluegrass didn't exist. Right. But um, at some point, um, Bill Monroe made his his sound out of one of these, and it became uh, the standard for bluegrass. And t tell me what you said about the serial and number. This is the same batch as Mr. Monroe's, and is uh, three serial numbers prior to it. And uh, this particular batch had an unusual binding where they put the extra lines on the sides rather than the front. Wow. So they're, they're re recognizable. Do, you, do we know where Bill Monroe's mandolin is? Uh, Bill Monroe's mandolin is in the Country Music Hall of Fame. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, <laughs> along with Mother Maybell's L5 guitar, uh, some other very exceptional pieces. Those, those two are pretty much wrote the book. You know, yeah, I mean, so. there's not much more you can say. Beautiful piece of workmanship and... Uh, like I said, probably intended for classical music in its own way, and some of the great players of that age played Russian music. Right. Dave Apollon, the great mandolinist, probably the greatest mandolinist, played mazurkas, and <laughs> who knows? Play a few more chords on it? I'd love to hear it some more. <laughs> strings for Keith. Yeah, this is true. He has one too many. Um, six too complicated. Six strings are too complicated. So, Maple, what do we got here, my man? This is amazing. 1950 Fender Broadcaster, later name changed to Telecaster a few years later. So literally it's called a Broadcaster because the Telecaster hadn't been No, it's named the same yet. instrument, but uh, Gretsch had a drum kit called the Broadcaster and they sued him 
<laughs> and they made them change the name. So it's called Telecaster all because of a drum kit. That's absolutely true. I didn't know that. And there's a few years in there where they just didn't have a name for it. And really? No decal on them. So what, you just call it a Fender? They call them no-casters, but that's not the official Oh, name. nowadays? Yeah, that's not the official Yeah, name. I've heard that, the no-caster. Yeah, there's a couple years between the Telecaster and the earlier broadcaster where there's no decal on them. Wow. And it's the first production assembly line solid body electric, electric guitar. guitar. So this is it right here. I'm holding it. And it starts there and it's very, it, it, it was, oh, it was designed to be made easily. But for some reason, because he consulted musicians, Leo Fender, uh -huh. consulted musicians, it came out great. But it was really, the design was to be able to make it on an assembly line. Right, right. Because definitely, you know, at that point, they weren't making Gibsons on assembly lines. No. You know, there was a big factory, but it was handwork. And this stuff is bandsaw, made with templates. So were Gibsons... Bolted together. Gibsons were more expensive at the time? Yes. They were, I, they're still more expensive. Yeah, right? they were trying to make a, a working man's guitar. Fender. Yeah. Yeah. So we've literally got the pre-Telecaster Telecaster right here. That's true. And the body is, what's the body made of? Originally ash or alder, and uh, that's a very heavy guitar. Yeah. A I lot of people uh, like the really light tellies. I, I don't really have a problem with that guitar at all, at yeah. whatever weight it comes in. Well, at. it balances well on yeah. the strap. Yeah. And then is this uh, maple neck? Maple neck. I think part of the characteristic of the fenders that I like is that the frets are actually in the neck. See, most instruments have a neck and then a fingerboard right. that the frets are in, but this actually is transmitting the vibration of the string directly into the neck. And I think you hear a little bit of fret noise, which I like, but I don't find that the rosewood fingerboard fenders sound to me like a fender should. Okay. It's one, one piece of wood for the neck and the frets are in it rather than a neck and a glued on fingerboard, right. which is where the strings are actually touching the sure, frets. Sure, sure. Oh, that's it. Well, in the, the 50s Stratocasters. There's, they hammered those frets right in that neck. Yeah. So I think there's a positive. What was vibration. the concept behind the fingerboard being added later? I suspect it was easier to repair them and replace them later. Got it. That makes sense. Because only the very earliest fenders have a maple fingerboard. Right. Let's see here. It in while, uh, while it's in my hands. Well, Maple, it was such a pleasure and honor to to see your instruments and for you Fun to be for gracious, me to letting me in here and absolutely and the education too. You know, this is one of the coolest things about me getting to do this is well, the stuff I learned. I'm pretty opinionated. That's okay. You I earned hope it. So. <laughs> yeah, you earned it. You earned it. So anyway, you guys, we got. Maple Byrne here, this amazing guitar collection. He's a legend out there, people know him. Um, and we got to see some of his great instruments and uh, just want to thank him and I hope you guys enjoyed getting to learn a little something and see some cool instruments. Thanks again, really appreciate My it. Pleasure, really man. fun to hang out with you. Uh, maybe I get to do it again sometime. You, like, Anytime. There's... When you're talking about these parties where like Warren Haynes and Sam Bush are jamming or whatever, like. I'll fly out. I mean, I, you know. There's plenty more to try. Actually, what I'll do is I'll just come as a pizza delivery guy. That'll work. And then I'll just stay. How about that? That'll work. Yeah, I'll be just like, oh, what's going on in here? <laughs> anyway, thanks, thanks again. Thanks for watching, you guys. It's an honor and a privilege. Thank so. you.